All right, now we're ready to start looking at concrete disk file system formats. Right now, we figured out how the operating system can locate and mount partitions. But the next thing that we need to figure out is what is the actual data layout on disk? How are we taking advantage of this API where we can access uh, disk blocks by read and write? And how can we get the functionality that we expect from a fire file system on a computer? The functionality that we expect is that we're going to have this hierarchy of directories and that directories can contain files. Every file and directory is going to have some metadata like file permissions, maybe owners. It depends whether we're on Windows or Linux or some other operating system exactly what metadata we want to have, but we need to be able to store the appropriate stuff and we need to be able to store it using this like block structure that we have in file systems. And we have to keep in mind from last time that we want to minimize random seeking as much as possible for performance. So in general, we have a directory tree something like this. And when we want to access a file or a directory within the directory tree, normally we have an interface to it using a path or the sort of key that we use to access. We can think of the whole file system as one big map and the key that we use to access data in that map is a string, the path. It's separated by some sort of directory separator, etc. So if we want to access this path down at the bottom, there are four segments in here. We have the root directory, that's the slash down here. Then we're going to have home, which is a directory. We have a mislove, that's apparently Professor Alan Mislove's home directory. And he has a music file named music.mp3. Now we have two kinds of paths that we're going to need to deal with from a sort of user perspective or from writing programs. And that is we have absolute paths or we specify the entire path from the root. That's the slash root on Linux style systems or the, uh, the disk letter on a Windows file system or a Windows system. But if we have the full path, then we've uniquely specified some object and that will work regardless of the current directory of the program or what our sort of reference point is. The other possibility is that we have relative paths. One of the properties that we have for every running process is a current working directory. And so if we just give a file name as the path to a file without any directories or directory separators, that still gives us a way to figure out what file we're talking about will look relative to the current directory. So if we just say syllabus.doc and we're in slash home slash cbw, we're looking for a file named syllabus.docx in slash home slash cbw in the current working directory. If we have something without that root reference, but that has a directory in it, we'll just tack whatever partial path we have onto our working directory and that gives us a path. We can even use things like parent directory, the dot dot, in order to get back to the previous directory and then navigate forward again. So we can build up paths with, or build up absolute paths with relative paths. Another important part here is that for every file, we have two different kinds of data that we're storing. Files themselves, we can think of as being sort of a sequence of bytes, where whatever program wrote the file wrote some bytes to the file, that's the data in the file, and that's the sort of core data that we're trying to store associated with the file. But we also have metadata about the file that's not part of the file, it's just about the file. And that includes things like the name of the file, includes keeping track of how big the file it is, keeps involves what directory did we leave it in. Under certain circumstances, the file could be in multiple directories. How is that represented? When was it created? Is it a system file? On Windows, that's one of the things that we track is a flag for system file. On Linux and Unix and modern Windows, we track owner and group. We track permissions. Those all need to be stored somewhere. And things like owner or permissions definitely aren't stored in the file themselves. The file doesn't change if we change the permissions of the file. The file contents doesn't change if we change the permissions of the file.
Another interesting thing to keep in mind is we have this weird idea of file extensions. When we name files, we tend to put a, frequently a three letter thing after a dot. And by convention, that tells us the type of the file. But depending on, sorry, in general, a file extension doesn't change how the data in the file like what the data in the file means. The program that reads the file is going to decide what the data in the file means. We can't just convert a audio file into a picture by renaming our .mp3 file into a .jpeg file. Now, some programs will use the file extension to try to guess what kind of data is in a file and therefore decide what program to open it with but the file extension is kind of metadata. It's just part of the file name. Other file metadata that we have include a unique identifier, sometimes. We have to have a mapping from the parts of the file to blocks on disk. And this um, mapping of file data regions to blocks on disk is an interesting thing where we have some options. For example, here in this picture, it says that this JPEG is one block, but the zip file is four blocks, and somehow this PDF file is in the middle of the blocks that are assigned to the zip file, and that's a valid thing that we can do. That um, both reduces internal fragmentation and is external fragmentation. So if we have a file and it's composed of one or more blocks, we have to figure out how we're going to map the file to its blocks. Now we saw that example before where we were going to allow a one file to be sort of stored in the middle of another file. And the data representation we want to be able to do that is that every file has an associated list of blocks. So if we're looking for data in a file and it's in the second if it's like if we have 512 byte blocks and we're looking for byte 700 we go ahead and do the arithmetic and find out that byte 700 is going to be in the second uh, second block of that file so we figure out where the second block of that file is by traversing the list so here for the zip file it would be block 5 is the second byte, byte of the file so then we go look in block 5 for byte 700 of that file this has some advantages and some disadvantages the biggest disadvantage uh, that we're going to talk about here is that for really large files, this starts to be a, like an awful lot of block numbers that we're storing. Every 512 byte block is going to require an 8 byte block number. And that's like more than 1% overhead just for the list of block numbers if we have 512 byte blocks. So maybe that's not great. Another problem is that we have uh, seeking here. So when we're trying to do a sequential read of the zip file, we have to skip over block number six. And so that may mean a seek, which is not what we want. The other sort of obvious alternative of how to do this is instead of storing a list of blocks, we'll just store two numbers. The number of the first block that we're storing that file in, and then how long the file is, and then just mandate that all files are contiguous. Now this has a problem, as we start to use up space, we may not be able to fit stuff. The example here is compared to this picture, if we want to add another file that is three blocks long, we have three free blocks on the disk, two, three, and eight are free, or zero, two, and three are free, but we can't put it in with this representation because this requires that all files be contiguous. With the list of blocks representation, we'd have no problem. So this is a trade-off, and it turns out that on modern file systems we use sort of a, a combination of these representations. But this is one of the design questions that we have to deal with in designing a file system. Now another thing that we definitely have is directories. And all the file systems that we have have this hierarchical tree of names. And everything that isn't a leaf in the tree, which is a, usually a regular file, the internal nodes in the tree are directories. And every directory has a list of entries, which are things that are inside it, but 
we generally also have two additional sort of virtual entries. We have dot, which points to the current directory. We have dot dot, which points to its parent. We also have metadata associated with directories, and that ends up being about the same metadata that we have for regular files. The big difference between directories and regular files is that the encoding of directories is an important part of the file system. So in sort of some random file, a, I don't know, Photoshop image file, only Photoshop cares what's in there. With a directory, we need to make sure that the operating system can read that directory. And if we have multiple directories, each one may have its own, or sorry, multiple file systems, each one may have its own directory format, which is representing the same sort of data. It's just not necessarily compatible with anything else. So if we start looking at how we could format a directory, one way we can do it is in the, the style of a old style Windows or MS-DOS fat file system. And this is almost talking about that, although we have directory permissions here for some reason, which isn't how this works. But in any case, this directory is going to be a big old array of structures. Each structure is sort of a row in this table. And for each row in the table, we're gonna have the name of an entry in the directory. We're going to have where that directory or where that object is on disk. And then we're going to have whether or not it's a directory and then additional metadata. So this Windows directory here is being referenced from the C colon slash directory. And it's at index three, which means that this little picture of a directory here is the Windows directory. In contrast, the users directory here is an index four, so it's that one. All right, so we have this encoding of directory entries that we have to figure out. And we have another interesting question. Do we want to store this sort of array of entries not in order? In which case we'll be able to add new entries just by sticking them on the end like vector push style. But the downside to that plan is that then if we want to find an entry in the directory, we have to scan the whole directory for it. Another option is we could sort it. And in that case, it's going to let us do a lookup real fast, log n time. We can do binary search. But then insert is going to take linear time because we're going to have to scan through, find the spot, insert the thing, and then push everybody after down one. And this is kind of a like obsolete question because on modern systems, you definitely just use B trees. And they're a little bit more complicated, but they give you the performance properties that you want. And a little bit of complication is worth significantly better performance, especially on large directories. Historically, systems like just have it be a list where we argue about ordered or unordered actually got used. That resulted in any directory with more than like 10,000 entries in it being a noticeable performance penalty for a computer. You'd have software that you had to build where you were storing a whole bunch of data and you had to make sure that you never put more than 10,000 things in a directory, like letting people do file uploads to a server. You'd have to structure the uploads directory in such a way that once it had more than a couple hundred items in it, it like separated them out into multiple directories, maybe based on the first two characters of the file name or the first two characters of the checksum of the file or some nonsense. And so this Move to B trees is a good idea, and it's not worth worrying too much about the other question. Uh, for implementing your file system in the upcoming homework, go ahead and do something that works, and that'll be fine. So the file system that we were trying to get to talk, talk about is the FAT file system. FAT sounds, stands for File Allocation Table. And this is named after the mechanism that it uses to uh, as its sort of general organization for files on the disk, and specifically blocks on the disk or clusters on the disk. So this was first introduced back in the late 70s, but um, it's still used today, but we don't use the original version from the 70s because it was for like 16-bit computers or yeah, 16-bit computers. We use the fancy version for 32-bit computers from 1996, 
which is kind of weird because we have 64-bit computers, but Microsoft had used, had moved to NTFS as their default file system before we really moved to 64-bit machines. And so FAT64 never really got developed because NTFS is just better. But for a simple file system, especially for removable devices like uh, USB flash drives, uh, SD cards and micro SD cards, FAT32 is still a like vaguely reasonable file system, and so we're still using it. Last time I was filming the disc lecture in front of the whiteboard behind me, and I was doing it on a digital camera, and for some pieces of that, when I was done recording, I got a wonderful message saying, you made too long a video, it has been split up into two parts, and the reason for that is because that particular digital camera records to an SD card that uses a FAT32 file system. And FAT32, because it has a 32-bit file size in it, has a limit of 4 gigs for file size. And thus, when I take uh, videos with my digital camera, occasionally I have to concatenate them back together in order to get a full-size video to upload to YouTube. But that's not the worst thing ever, unless you for some reason didn't know how, how to concatenate videos, and then it would be super obnoxious, and maybe uh, camera manufacturers should upgrade to a file system from more recent than uh, 1996. I've got a couple to recommend for them in this deck of slides. In any case, they're going to ignore me, and probably FAT32 will be fine for a while. So the idea here is that our disk layout for FAT32 is going to consist of a super block, which is going to store some sort of global metadata for the file system. Things like the version, the location of the operating system kernel for boot, the total number of uh, the total number of blocks that the file system is being split up to, up into, and on FAT style file systems we call the blocks clusters because they aren't necessarily individual disk blocks. Uh, the FAT file system likes to use blocks that are bigger than disk blocks, maybe 4K, if we have 512 byte disk blocks, that's significantly bigger, or even much larger. With FAT32, you can go up to like 32K clusters, which is an interesting trade-off in wasting disk space versus reducing fragmentation versus other stuff. But yeah, we aren't necessarily working in directly in disk blocks. The other piece of metadata that we're going to store in here is the index of the root directory. Now, another thing that we have is our list uh, is our collection of clusters. So when we format this file system, we decide how many clusters they're going to be. They generally do range in size from 4K to 64K. And files, of course, potentially need to be stored in multiple blocks. And to figure out which blocks our files are going to be stored in, we use this last piece of the thing, which is the file allocation table. Now, for every cluster in our file system, we have an entry in the file allocation table. The entries in our file allocation table are 32-bit integers. And the thing that we're doing with the file allocation table is we're building linked lists in order to keep track of where multi-block files are. This is kind of a neat solution to the problem of storing multi-block files. It's got some trade-offs. It's definitely relatively simple, though, which is kind of neat. Now, directories are just special files that have file data in them in some sort of format that's known to the file system. And then in this file allocation table that we have, there are a couple of different possible values we could have in there. If we have the 32-bit integer 0, that means that the associated block of the uh, the associated cluster is unused. The number one is reserved, and then if we have a number between one and max int, this is telling us that this is not the last block of the current file. Instead, this is going to point to a uh, different block where we're going to find the next block of the file. And then, so we look, if for example, we're looking at a file in block four, and over here in file allocation table block four, it has the number seven. 
that means that the next block of the file is in block 7, and then we need to look in file allocation table slot 7 to see if there's any more of the file. Finally, for linked list, we need an end of list indicator, and max int is used for that. So technically, we can't have 2 to the 32 blocks. Uh, 2 to the 32 minus 3 is the maximum number of clusters that we can have in a FAT32 file system. So our super block is going to say that the root directory is at index 2. So then index 2 is going to get marked as not empty. So it looks like darker green is used, some value other than uh, other than 0, and light green is a 0. Then in here we're going to have our uh, directory, which is going to have its array of directory entries. Now we're going to add a couple more directories. To add a couple more directories, we're going to have to add slots in our root directory. We'll put them on disk in clusters 3 and 4. We'll fill in clusters 3 and 4 to indicate that they are no longer empty. And then our root directory is going to have entries put in it to point to a thing named Windows. Index 3, that's file allocation table entry 3, cluster, uh, data cluster 3. And users is over in 4. If you want a regular file, in this case, it's going to be three clusters long because it's the page file. The root directory, the directory that that file is in, is going to point to the first chunk or first cluster of that file. Then, because the file allocation table at slot five points to slot six, we know the file isn't done. It points to slot seven. We know the file isn't. Oh, in slot 7, we can look and we can see the OXFFF, which indicates end of chain. We know the file's done. Another file, same sort of thing. Now, this particular file that we just added is in the Windows directory. So there's no reference to it in the root directory. Instead, it's going to get pointed to from the uh, from the Windows directory. Another important thing to see here about this file system is that basically all of our metadata is in the directories. The only thing that's not in the directories is the list of blocks, which is stored in the file allocation table in this linked list structure. File name is in the directory. Uh, whether the thing is a directory or not is in the directory, and other metadata. FAT32 doesn't actually have RWX permissions, but things like system file or hidden file are also stored in the directory. Now, the length of the file allocation table is the same as the number of clusters on the disk for data. This is decided when we format the partition, and also the size of a cluster is decided when we format the partition. So that all is just pre-decided ahead of time. The maximum number of files we can possibly have is limited by the number of clusters and the length of the FAT. And then mostly we'll be talking about FAT32, but the, the number indicates how big the integers are. So if this were FAT16, these would each be a 16-bit integer. If this is FAT32, these are each a 32-bit integer. You'll note here that the like OXFFF, that's a 16-bit integer. There would be eight Fs for FAT32. With our nice setup, blocks of a file don't necessarily need to be contiguous. That has advantages in that we can still write to disk as long as there's space, as long as we still have clusters free. But it also is the disadvantage that things can get spread all over the place. And if things do get spread all over the place, that's not going to be great for hard disks. So if we want to read a file, we start at apparently uh, cluster 58 in the fat. It's going to tell us that we need to go to uh, 58 to 65 to 67, to 61, and then that's the end of our file. So this could be a lot of seeking. So FAT is a file system, and it has some benefits. 
it lets us do all of the absolute basic stuff that we want. We can have this hierarchy which maps paths to file data and file metadata, minimal file metadata, but still enough file metadata to be useful for storing files. And so that's why we still use it. It does the basic job. There are some disadvantages with FAT32. For example, FAT32 has a maximum disk size of two terabytes. Another disadvantage, FAT32 has a maximum file size of four gigabytes. Another disadvantage, if we want to locate free clusters on the disk, we have to scan the entire file allocation table for entries that have a value of zero. There's no sort of index somewhere that has a list of uh, free entries. A sort of obvious improvement that we could do to the file allocation table would be to have a second list. We could have a free list with the head in the super block and then have this linked list of all the free entries. And that would speed things up for sequential access, but then be terrible for concurrent or parallel access. So I'm not sure I actually recommend that design change. The worst problem though with the file allocation table file system design is that it is terrible for hard disks, which is what it was designed for. Reads, and especially reads, potentially require a lot of random seeking as the file system fills up and becomes fragmented. One thing that you definitely used to do all the time with FAT32 based Windows computers was you had to run a defragmentation program in order to get your computer performance better because things had gotten so fragmented that this lag from seeking a hard disk would be noticeably slowing down your computer. Uh, nowadays with modern file systems and SSDs, defrag isn't a thing that you have to do all the time, but it used to be a thing. It was like you did it every few months on your Windows machine. So here's an example. We're going to open a file and we're going to read from that file four blocks. So we'll start, find the directory, and in order to read the directory, we have to do some seeking to get to the end of the directory. Uh, apparently the arrows aren't quite lining up. I think that's trying to point it here. But then in the directory, we found the file. So the file starts at, uh, looks like, yeah, I can't even tell where the file starts, but for the for the file, we're gonna have to seek around again to get all the blocks of the file. And so basically we're spending all our time seeking in this sort of example where things are slightly, slightly shuffled up and everything wasn't just written sequentially to disk. Oh, it looks like there's more seeking. This isn't mandatory in FAT, but it does eventually happen as the disk gets relatively full and you delete small things and put in more stuff. All right, so that was the FAT file system, which is the simplest file system that we're going to look at. Next up, we're going to look at Linux-style file systems, but I'll be back in a second for that.